Tonight, we're going to study the words of your mouth. I think some of you ought to write that down. The words of your mouth. Oh, praise God. The words of your mouth. Praise the Lord. We're going to start in Proverbs 13, Proverbs 13, and verse 3. Proverbs 13 and verse 3. Are you ready for that? Proverbs 13 and verse 3. I'm going to read from the New American Standard Bible. It says, The one who guards his mouth preserves his life. That's pretty strong. If you guard your mouth, you'll preserve your life. You know, the people that are not used to planning things in their heart and speaking out of their mouth, they're used to saying anything they want to say. I've got some relatives that say, I'm old enough, I can say whatever I want to say. I can do whatever I want to do. And yes, there is uh, an amendment. The First Amendment says that you have the right to speech. Now, that right has been... Uh, altered at time or two people don't have the right to speech if it's just taking a spray can and putting words on a government building they can be arrested for that even though they say you have the right to speech uh, there's some guidelines to that speech I think God's given us a guideline to guard the words of our mouth it preserves our life and the one who opens wide his mouth and lets everything come out, it will bring his life to ruin. To ruin. Now, in Psalms 19, it says in verse 14, Psalms 19, verse 14, again from the New American Standard Bible, you can read this from almost any Bible. It reads just the same. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That's almost that way, word for word, in every single Bible. Because that rule to us from God, it ties the words of our mouth with the meditation of our heart. And the meditation of our heart with the words of our mouth. They're tied together. What are we meditating on? That is what's going to be coming out of our mouth. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If we're not a, really meditating on much, the mouth will speak whatever it wants to speak. Words are very important. Don't just speak your mind. <laughs> Meditation. Does anybody know what meditation means? Well, I'm glad you came. The Bible? Bible definition of meditation. Mutter. 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 Mut muttering, muttering to yourself. Not murmuring. <laughs> muttering. Not gossiping. Muttering. Muttering. It means to repeat the thing over and over until you get it. You know how they have actors and actresses learn their lines? They repeat them so often that it's normal for them to speak them. Sometimes they speak the other people's lines too so they know exactly what the other person is going to say and they have rehearsals where some people speak the lines that they're going to speak and they speak their lines and that way they learn all the set because they speak it over and over and over. You can, listen to me, you can memorize the Bible. I've had people tell me, well, I, I can't do that. I can't memorize that. I could never be an actress. Anything you repeat enough to yourself, it will become the word to you. Mm -hmm. We have a four-year-old grandson. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have a four-year-old yeah. grandson that learns by rote repetition. That's how they teach him. That's what he learned. He, he knows yeah. at least a dozen books from cover to cover. Because they repeat the books to him so often, he learns them. He learns everything about them. Even what pictures go with what words. 
You might say, well, he's a bright little boy. No brighter than you are. You've got a four-year-old mind. Come on. Yeah. And you can memorize this <laughs> sure, stuff sure. if you choose. Now, we should strive to let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable unto God. We want our words and our meditation to be the same. The words that you speak affects your heart. The words that you speak affects your heart. And any many times, the Bible refers to heart as thoughts or feelings or mind. But this is truth. Your heart is also considered your inner man. It's the center. It's the core. It's who you are. In fact, when we tell people, my tree is dying from the center of my tree is affected from the center, we're saying, well, that's the middle. Where we are, where we're supposed to be, the meditation of my heart, we can talk about certain things in the heart. That's the center of it. So this is exactly what it's talking to us. The heart is the center. David said this. He said, let the very center of me, all my thoughts and feelings, he said that in Psalms 19, verse 4. Let my thoughts, let my feelings, let my emotions, let my intellect, let everything I'm doing be acceptable unto the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, no matter what I'm thinking about, be acceptable unto God. Has there ever been someone you know that has not let their words be guarded? They just say whatever they want to say. How does that affect you? You? <laughs> How does that affect you? Anybody? It affect you positive or negative? negative? Sometimes when you're around those kind of people, you go, ooh, I forgot why I don't want to be around you. I don't want to be around you because your mouth just shoots off. Well, the heart is influenced by the words you speak, and the words you speak influence the muttering in your heart. So, your words connected to your heart. The words that you say over and over affect the way you mutter to yourself. Because that's what muttering is. You say it to yourself. But muttering out loud can also be the same as muttering to yourself. You can quote the word out, out, out loud and you can memorize it. It's the same as putting it in your heart. So the words of your mouth are influenced by what's in your heart. But your heart is influenced by the words of your mouth. Mm -hmm. So they're both connected. They're both connected. Words affect our feelings. Yes. Anybody agree with that? Yes. You can talk yourself into being depressed. Words affect your desires. <clears throat> you can look at something so much, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that. You can convince everybody you don't want that. There'll come a time when you've said it so many times, they even re they will believe you don't want that. Mm -hmm. Do you know that there are some people that get on the witness stand that are known liars, <laughs> and oh, and they can lie. Can they lie? They said the lie so many times they even pass a lie detector because they've spoken the word so many times they believe it in their heart. It's the truth. Listen, our desires, our affections, our perceptions, our imagination, our understandings are all influenced by the words that we speak. In Proverbs 18 and verse 21, Proverbs 18, verse 21, you probably know this. I'm going to read it from the New International Version. It says, the tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. And those that love it believe it. In other words, whatever you have in your mouth, that's what you prove that you love. That You love that because you wouldn't put it in your mouth if you knew it was going to kill you. Anybody ever in this room ever eaten a blowfish? No. Did you know they're poisonous? Mm -hmm. And that if you eat it and you don't eat the proper part, you can die? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, that's the truth. Do you know there are certain foods that are poisonous? 
And, and if you carry them in your mouth, you'll die. Isn't it funny that some animals already know not to eat the poisonous food? They're like, oh, no, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> but we're silly enough to get it on our tongue, and it kills people. Did you know that overdosing on drugs would kill you? Mm-hmm. But we've got thousands of people every day that overdose. Some die. Roughly 7 million people die a day. Thousands of them from overdose in America. I know that's kind of interesting because there's 400, almost 500 million that live in the States. That's the curse. Yeah. Yeah. See, the tongue has the power of life and death. Words, words that you speak can bring joy or words that you speak can bring grief. Life or death. You can you can build up and stir up and cheer up or you can tear down and rip apart. I mean, it's all your words. And anybody ever raised with someone that they didn't watch their words so good and they were just slapping you upside the head knocking you down the hallway with the words of their mouth? Because that's the way their mama raised them. Mm-hmm. Well, there are a lot of children that have to take uh, some kind of... They talk to people to try to get those kind of negative thoughts out of their head. Don't let yourself be one of those. You are susceptible to words. I know we've said sticks and stones will break my bones, but words won't hurt me. Words will kill you. You put enough words out, I don't care what it is. If it's a bad word, it'll kill you. People that associate with you and you associate with them, you need to be sure that their words are in line with God's Word because your heart gets affected. And when your heart is affected, often enough, you have a tendency not to believe God's Word, but you believe the words that were spoken. Do you know that a lot of people have difficulty with self-esteem because someone has spoken something irrational to them about their face or the way they look or about their hair or about the way they dress? And those words have affected them for a lifetime. Now, in 1 Kings 3 and verse 5, God told Solomon, God said to Solomon, you can ask for whatever you want. In 1 Kings 3 verse 5, he told Solomon, you can ask for whatever you want. Anybody know what Solomon asked for? He didn't ask for gold. He didn't ask for new shoes. He didn't ask for the key to the washroom. What did he ask for? Come on. Wisdom. wisdom. He said, principle of the wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get it. Here we go. Solomon asked for wisdom. Solomon loved God with all of his heart. This was the number one thing going for him. But the second and very important thing going for him, his father loved God with all his heart. So we have something that's very important. Him being David's son and and him also loving God himself. The Bible says that Solomon became the richest man in all the earth. Because what did he want? Wisdom. He wanted the words of his mouth to match up with the meditation of his heart. He wanted to love God. He wanted the wisdom of God. But did anybody know what happened to Solomon? Ooh. Solomon had a very bad downfall. What did he do? Somebody help me. Good thing you came. Solomon began to hang out with strange women. They were loose of tongue. And they let everything come out of his mouth. And he began to be susceptible to those things. Gave up his love for God. And it reneged on what he was doing. And began to worship false gods. Now all this because... He was associated with those that did. Acts chapter 13, it says in verse 22, talking about David, Solomon's dad. David, it says, concerning David, in Acts chapter 13, verse 22 from the NIV, it says, David, look, I found a man that is after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, how many know David also made a few mistakes? Oh, yes. 
But did God get rid of him? He never reneged his relationship with God. He was quick to repent and he was quick to forgive. And that's what separated him from even his kids. One thing, when Solomon began to look out of his uh, upper chambers, when all the kings were going out to battle, he stayed home. And he stood out on his balcony, and he saw a beautiful woman out on her balcony, and she was bathing. Anybody know what her name was? Bersheba. Yeah, Bersheba. And he's out there, he's looking out there. What's that? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. No, Bathsheba. She's out there taking a bath. So she's out there and he sees that and he says, I want that woman for myself. So he calls that woman unto him. He has the kingly way with her. He sends her back to her house and later finds out she's pregnant. So he takes Yuri, the Hittite, and he sends him out to the front lines of the battles that are going on. And Yuri somehow still lives. And so they send him into the deepest, deepest part and Yuri the Hittite dies. And he doesn't get all sad or anything. He just takes the woman to be his wife. So, did God condemn him? Because even though he did make mistakes, he repented of his mistakes, and he still wrote a lot of psalms. He still was the guy that took down the giant. Even though you've had masterful things in your background that look so good, you've got to continue to stay right. You've got to repent. You've got to keep your words right. You've got to keep your mouth right. Now, David was still used of God because he got his heart right. His heart and his mouth began to speak praises unto God, and he was still used of God. How did he do that? He was meditating. He was meditating. He muttered the Word. The words can give you strength. The words can give you firmness in your relationship with God. He meditated the Word, and it gave him integrity once again. Now, Proverbs in chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 1 through 4. It says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart Keep my commandments. I'm taking this from the King James. For the length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not your mercy or your truth forsake thee, and let them be about your neck. Write them down on tablets of your heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God. This is part of God's plan. Never forget the Word. Let the Word boil over. Meditate that Word. Think about that Word. Now, especially in this corona time, especially if you've been locked up, especially if you've still got some time at home, you've got plenty of time to talk about the Word. I think people ought to take a little time each day and meditate on that Word. I think they ought to review that word, think about that word, say that word. It's important to talk the word of God. These scriptures talk about the fullness of the will of God. And in that will of God, in trying to meet the will of God, we ought to repent and we ought to make sure our words are right. Because, listen, I've heard so many words and probably participated in some of them that are not right with God we got to confess our sins and change our heart. Now, in John, excuse me, where was I? Oh yes, in John 1, in 1 John 1 and verse 9, it says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God wants to change your very heart. Now, let's look at Psalms 19 and verse 14 one more time. Psalms 19 and verse 14. I read it already once, but it's very, very important. Psalms 19 and verse 14. I was brought up in a Boy Scout troop, and part of the closing prayer was always repeating 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I had no idea how important that would be in my life. But I said it so many times. I was in there about six years. I was there at least three nights a week. And so if you look at that, and I quoted it that often, it was like, wow, that's a lot of times to say that verse. And it meant something to me. So that's Psalms 19 and verse 14. What you say and what you say continually always affects your heart. Anybody ever said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm stupid. We do that uh, kind of when we're upset, we make a mistake. I'm so stupid. <laughs> I know I'm not the only one. But some people need to get a handle on that because you can talk yourself into it. And don't let that happen. Watch your association with other people. It will affect your heart. The words of your mouth will have a lot to do with what happens to you and with the meditation of your heart has a lot to do with what you say. So what you say has a lot to do with what goes in your heart. What goes in your heart has a lot to do with what you say. You need to watch the words that come out your mouth. Your words can be acceptable unto God or they can be unacceptable unto God. The choice is yours. Now for the next few minutes, I'd like to talk with you about how you put a guard over your mouth. Ooh, praise God. How do you put a guard on your mouth? Well, Psalms 141 and verse 3, it says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. You know, you can encourage yourself to have your words watched by the Lord. I don't think that we have taken this as serious as we should. We can encourage God to shock us, stimulate us, entreat us to get some handle on us so that our words are watched and we keep the watch of the door of our lips. I know that some of my relatives don't like to hear that, but they have let everything out of there and it's hurt other people and they say, well, I'm grown enough, I'm big enough, I can say whatever I want to say. Yeah, we can, but that doesn't mean you should. I can run a red light too, but that doesn't mean I should. I mean, <laughs> there's some law that we need to follow. So, let's just look at this for a minute and see if we can determine a few areas that will help us get a handle on our words. First one. You got to dedicate your mouth to the Lord. Dedicate your heart, dedicate your mind, and dedicate your mouth to the Lord. Dedicate your heart, dedicate your mind, dedicate your mouth to the Lord. And here's here's part of number 1. Pray for purity. You know, of all the things that you could ask for, Solomon asked for wisdom. Wise words are pure words, true words, loving words, gentle words. They don't bring disgust. They don't bring grief. Words that are spoken that are not godly are like riotous words. Come on, we've all seen different riots going on. And what sparks those people the most? Words that are spoken. They hear words and they're ready to fight. We have got to guard ourselves and pray for purity. Another one, real simple, in Hebrews 13, verse 15, it says it like this, Therefore, by Him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. That's what he says that we should do with our mouth. You know, when you're tempted to say anything, you ought to just stop. <laughs> praise the Lord. You ought to just praise God. The fruit of our lips ought to give thanks unto His name. That's the scripture. Now, this sacrifice of praise does not include speaking gossip. 
you got to sacrifice the gossip. you got to sacrifice the the foul word, you got to sacrifice the slander, you got to, I'm going to help you here, you got to sacrifice the words of fear. In the last several months, I've known there's been lots of folks catch themselves after they've spoken it for about 30 minutes, they go, well, I don't want to say that anymore, <laughs> because fear just comes out. We are riled up by fear. Fear has captured people's hearts. Fear has captured their minds. Fear brings such bondage. The Bible says fear brings bondage. It brings such bondage, we locked ourselves up in the house. It brings torment, the Bible says. It does bring torment. What kind of torments do you think fear brings? You won't participate in anything because you're afraid. You know, if we didn't want to drive unless all the lights were green, we would stay home. <laughs> I think that there there was one politician that said, unless we find a cure for the Corona-19, we need to all stay in our houses. I'm going to help you. That cure, even if you get that cure, somebody's going to get Corona-19. And you say, how come? Do you know they have vaccines for almost every flu? And people every year still get them? And you say, how is that possible? There's still, there's vaccines out for mumps. People still get mumps. There's vaccines out for measles. People still get measles. How come? Because that virus is still out there. Just because you get a vaccine doesn't mean it stops, okay? So you've got to pray for your mind, you got to pray for your heart, you got to pray for your mouth. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 45, it says, Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth will speak. You ought to be careful what you put in your heart. Meditate the word on your heart. Let that stay in there. we got to quit watching the news. Uh, listen, I know some people that do 24-7 news. Keep it on all the time in their house. They're watching CNN, MSB, MS, whatever it is. Uh, they put that stuff on and they'll just do, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. When you go to visit with them, I've been to their houses, been those people's houses many times, and sit down to talk with them, and they still will glance over at the TV. It's the same news that plays every 30 minutes, and they'll still watch it. And you say, why? I don't know. Some people are inundated with the bad news. We've got to change that. Number two, you got to pray for an awareness of your words. Just like we prayed for a guard over our heart, you got to pray for an awareness of your words. You know that our words are so important that other people's lives can be influenced by them. If we don't watch how we talk to our spouse, we could actually injure them with the words coming out of our mouth. If I choose a wrong word, I damage you. Just by one word. I have experienced this kind of thing before. We need to watch our words. Watch our words. Pray that God put an awareness in us over our words. In other words, we've got to speak intentionally. What if our Congress people all spoke only intentionally, not just whatever they wanted to say? <laughs> Wouldn't this be a different life if we just if we just took some responsibility for what's leaking out of our mouth? Now, what comes out of our mouth is just like a tube of toothpaste. Once you squeeze it, you can't put that toothpaste back. I don't care what you try to do. You can't jam it back in. You can't throw it back in. You can't get it back in the tube. Because you've got to take some responsibility. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. It says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of my mouth. Now you can quote that and quote that, and quote that, and mutter that, until that is part of your life. And you can begin to operate with no corrupt communication coming out of your mouth. But I will only let that which is good and necessary for edification. 
that it may impact grace to all those that hear it. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. You know, we often speak corrupt communication to ourselves. Without even realizing it, we're our biggest influencer. We say things like this, Oh, I'm so stupid. I can't believe I did that. I'm so dumb. What's wrong with me anyway? Listen, if you keep speaking that stuff, our brains are so good, it's going to go looking for an answer. Mm -hmm. You ought to say something else. I have the mind of Christ. I have the wisdom of God formed in me. I speak things that are good and lovely and good report and virtue and praise. I think on these things. I let no corrupt communication come out of my mouth, but that which is edifying brings grace to the hearer. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, there's power in meditating the Word. Mm -hmm. Now, my grandfather used to say it like this, taste your words and see if you want to spit them out. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some truth to that. Because I, I, I say things like this. I, I don't like anyone to walk around when the kids were small and they walked around with a sad face or something. I didn't like sad faces. I'd say, go look at yourself in the mirror. And, and they would just they'd give me that frown or that look roll and roll their eyes. And I'd pick them up and roll them back. And I'd say, this, you have got to see the way you look. And, and we never let corrupt communication. If people begin to speak foul things, we'd stop them right there. We'd say no. And... You know, the biggest thing that would go on that started corrupt communication was scrapping with one another. The small kids just, they would start a little conversation and scrap and they'd talk about it, and then next thing you know, there's an argument going on. Because they let corrupt communication come out of their mouth. So you have to take a hold of that stuff. Now, number three. This is a biggie. Big, the big three. Here's number three. Surrender your right to complain. <laughs> I'll say it again because some people are writing it down. Surrender your right to complain. Well, Philippians 2 and verse 14 says this from the expanded Bible. Do everything without complaining. <laughs> oh my goodness, that can't be much more clear. Stop your complaining. Grumbling, grumbling and complaining are part of our nature. We complain if the food isn't quick enough. We complain if our hair can't get done right. We complain if the bed won't make up right. We complain if there's... The trash man didn't pick up the trash that day. We complain if the yard man didn't do all the yard work. That we find everything to complain about. Well, we ought to give up our right to complain. And the Lord said it like this. Complaining doesn't edify anything. <laughs> you're, you're right, Lord. Listen, I have had him. I said, Lord, help me not to complain. I don't want to complain. I'm serious. I don't want complaining. Complaining is not a good thing. And the Lord said complaining doesn't edify anything. Man, take another night around Mount Sinai. That's what the Bible says. The children of Israel went around Mount Sinai over and over and over they trying to they kept complaining. <laughs> I asked the Lord specifically to help keep my words right. Keep them right. I got a lot of folks that are listening to me that are looking for me to continue. It's not just the leadership, but it ought to be every Christian leaves keeps their words right. You need to replace every complaining word with something good and gentle. Wouldn't that change things? I know it does for me. When I'm in the midst of complaining, and that has happened, the Lord said, you better get a handle on that and I'll just go to praise Him. I'll tell you what, complaining stops. we got to ask for forgiveness and go before the Lord and get a B.A., a better attitude. Because <laughs> right now we have a B.A. in bad attitude, okay? <laughs> we, need, we need to get a better attitude. We need to get a better attitude. Now, if we're going to ask for, and really that's number four, if we're going to ask for forgiveness and we're going to get our attitude right, 
James 3 and verse 2 says it like this. And I'm taking this from God's Word's translation. God's Word translation. It says all of us make mistakes. And if someone doesn't make any mistakes when he speaks, he would be perfect. We all make mistakes when we speak. If he didn't make mistakes when he speak, he could be perfect. He would be able to control everything, all the time, everything that he does. But we all know that we can't control everything that we do because our mouth stops us. So we need to get a handle on our mouth. This is important. And ask God to forgive us. we got to commit to working on the words of our mouth, the words that we speak, that will actually demonstrate the love of God in my words. Oh, that's a good one. Demonstrate the love of God in my words. That'll change some things. Number six. And the last one. You ready for this? Did I give you all of them? I'll, I'll start over so you can hear. Number one, you got to dedicate your mind, your heart, and your mouth to the Lord. Number two, you got to pray God gives you an awareness of your words. Number three, you got to surrender your right to complain. Number four, you got to ask for forgiveness of your words and your attitude. And number five, you got to practice speaking words that encourage and inspire. Practice speaking words that encourage and inspire. If I was going to ask you, who was your favorite teacher? Everybody had a favorite teacher. Well, at least I did. Everybody had a favorite teacher, I think. And it's usually the one that encouraged you. The one that inspired you. We have a favorite friend. They encourage you. They laugh at your jokes. It inspires you. You like to be around them because you get encouraged by them. We have a tendency to be drawn to those that encourage us and inspire us. We have a tendency to repel those that don't encourage us and those that don't inspire us. If you think about the people you defriend, and it's not just Facebook, but when you defriend them and you will not do anything else with them, it's because they've discouraged you once too often. You build up, you cheer up, you stir up, you stay around those that encourage you. If they spend time encouraging, I don't care what it is, from the way you look, to what you dress, to what you say, if they encourage you and say, oh, that was good. If they encourage you and say, that tastes great. If they encourage you and say, I like to be around you. I don't care what it is, but if they encourage you, you want to hang out with them. And so by the words of our mouth, we can determine who's going to be in our church. I'm telling you, you'll have nothing but Pied Piper people hanging around you if you use your words to encourage. Mm -hmm. We use our words to tear them up. <laughs> We're going to rip their head off. We have a tendency to want everything to come out of our mouth except this. 1 Peter 3 and verse 10. It says, He that would love life and see good days, let him refer his tongue from evil. If you want to see long life and good days, you got to get a handle on your tongue. And let your lips speak no deceit. We love to be encouraged, but we hate to be lied to. We love to be encouraged, but we don't like folks that will not inspire us. They don't encourage us. They put us down. They talk about something we've done or what's not good. Our goal in all of life is to speak the Word. Because the Bible says God is life and God is light. 
God is life and God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. And if God is life, then our goal, and it's to speak the Word, our goal is to speak life to people. Because that is God. We should speak life to people. We should encourage. We should build up. We should stir up. We should cheer up. We should speak life. One of the prayers that we've always prayed over people is we speak life to them. Huh? Even if they're on their deathbed, mm -hmm. we speak life to them. Because that's the Word of God to you. You've got to build up others. You've got to encourage others. You know, a lot of times to encourage people and build them up, it just means to soothe them. You know, every once in a while, my wife says, you could have said that differently. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say something like, she'll say, oh, I worked really hard on this, and this was hard, and I had to do this, I had to do that, I had to do this. I go, well, thank you. She goes, you could have said that better. <laughs> well, what do you want me to say? Then she'll say, well, you've done a great job. Oh, and I go, you did a great job. She goes, now you said what I said. <laughs> That's no big deal. <laughs> because people need to hear the soothing words of your voice. Are you soothing people with what you say? Soothing them with encouragement. Soothing them with comfort. Mm -hmm. Soothing them with joy. They need to hear that what you have seen them do has brought you joy. So it soothes people. It's kind of like God. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. He gets a kick out of you going into His presence because that's where joy is. He wants you in His presence. You've got to inspire and motivate others because when you inspire and you motivate, you energize them. We're always looking for people to do better. And when I was speaking at all kinds of businesses, one thing I always told them was you have to encourage your workers. You can't demotivate them. Because once you start demotivating and once you're not encouraging them, they will not be energized to do their work. They won't fulfill the task at hand. You may have a quota for the day, but they'll do everything they can to keep from fulfilling it. You can have everything you want if you would encourage them. You can build them up. You can stir them up. You can cheer them up. Now, you need to watch the words of your mouth. And that's all we have for today.